Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. We're, uh, we're excited to have a, a panel discussion here on the, um, on the new rules on general solicitation. I guess as everyone knows in early July the SEC adopted some new rules allowing for general solicitation in certain private uh, stock offerings and um, today I'm thrilled to have um, a great panel with us. Um, to my right is Anne-Marie Tierney who's the Executive Vice President of Legal Affairs and General Counsel at Second Market. Um, Anne's going to uh, mitigate some of the uh, legal mumbo jumbo uh, that uh, four of my partners and myself uh, here at Goodwin Proctor will will talk about. I have uh, Jonathan Axelrad and Tom Bowden to, to my left who are both in our uh, private investment funds uh, group. They represent funds. Uh, in the creation of funds and, and deal with um, these, these private stock offerings on the fund side on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, to my right, I have Brad Weber, who's a technology and corporate <laughs> lawyer uh, that does a lot of uh, private company work as well as uh, significant amounts of capital markets work. Um, I'm Anthony McCusker. I'm a technology company's lawyer um, along with Brad. And then uh, to the far left, we have uh, Bryn Peltz, uh, fashionably late from New York, uh, who will be arriving here um, shortly to, to join us. Uh, we're going to try to keep this um, hopefully practical. We want to uh, start by walking through the new rules um, at a high level, get some information out there, uh, talk about um, you know, some of the impacts it may have on both private companies considering offerings like this as well as uh, fund formation work. Um, and then we're going to get into um, some practical advice um, and Anne-Marie is going to steer us uh, in significant ways down that road, how we see some of the various practitioners uh, and market participants um, utilizing these rules and how they may impact. Uh, we're going to try to keep this uh, interesting, interactive to the extent people have questions and get you back to your desks in the next couple hours so that you can go book the the fancy billboards on 101 before the people out watching on the web get them all. Um, so with that, maybe Jonathan, you can take the, take the lead. Sure thing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to try and do the broad-based overview, um, explain from a high level what uh, new Rule 506C is, uh, put it in a little bit of historical context, um, provide a couple of warnings and disclaimers um, before we pass it on to other members of the panel to discuss uh, things in a greater level of detail. Um, so, you know, for many decades, if you were a young company or a fund manager trying to raise a private fund, you basically had two choices in terms of how you would raise money by issuing securities. You could do a fully registered public offering, um, think big, complex, million dollar legal fees, um, which we like, um, or a private offering, which is basically defined as something not including any public offering. Uh, and that's the way it's been. The Jobs Act, a couple of years ago, directed the SEC to introduce a new path. And this is the kind of thing only lawyers could come up with. Um, under this new path, you can have a private offering that includes an offering to the entire public as long as you only actually issue securities to accredited investors. Um, so the SEC got this directive from Congress. Um, on July 10th of this year, just about two weeks ago, the SEC adopted new rule 506C. That's going to be our primary topic today. And it will become effective on September 23rd, which means right now we're in a little bit of a pause period while people catch their breath, figure out what's going on, and then the starter's pistol will go off on September 23rd. Um, rule 506C uh, likely will have a very significant impact on the fundraising behavior of companies and funds. Um, for one thing, it will promote the use of the internet in fundraising in a, a way that we've never seen before, and it more generally will greatly expand the pool of potential investors that can be contacted during a fundraising exercise. Uh, it'll ease restrictions on speaking with the press. Um, it will probably shift the balance of power among the players in the business, giving more power to issuers because they will have more choices about who to raise their capital from. Um, uh, and uh, commensurately less power to people who actually uh, can write the checks. Uh, Rule 506E, being you know, a legal system, uh, does have its requirements and limitations. Uh, the key thing that gets all the big attention is that it 
requires verification of the accredited investor status of the people who actually acquire securities in the offering, and Marie will speak at great length about that. Um, it doesn't impact the laws of any other country. And one of the things we'll talk about is that there are lots of other countries that have bans on general solicitations um, of investors. And if you want to raise money in those countries, what you do here may impact your ability to raise money in those countries. Um, and it doesn't, unlike uh, prior law, uh, permit any non-accredited investors at all to participate in the offering, although, as we'll discuss, there are a few ways around that in limited circumstances. Uh, another big thing that many of you have probably already heard about is that lots of people are worried about 506C. Um, in particular, that by enabling a general offering of securities to the public, um, that it will release some sort of significant um, uh, increase in uh, fraud against investors. Um, the SEC, simultaneously with adopting Rule 506C, adopted new rules that, that prohibit participation in private offerings by so-called bad actors. And we're going to have a whole separate presentation on that. The SEC also proposed, didn't adopt, um, some very significant new oversight and compliance rules. And we'll have a separate presentation on that. Um, we note that federal and state regulators have lots of power under existing anti-fraud laws, um, in particular the power to expand the way those laws are applied, and we may see a lot of activity there as they try and expand the application of those laws in the general solicitation context under 506C. Um, there's also been uh, a number of urgings and proposals to uh, raise the standards for what is an accredited investor, and we'll talk about why that might uh, be attractive to some people. Um, and I think we just want to be generally sensitive to the fact that federal and state regulators are going to be a little bit more skeptical and cautious when looking at offerings that involve a general solicitation of the public. And then finally, um, the plaintiff's bar, those people who love to, uh, to sue issuers, uh, they're already gearing up for this. Uh, and I'll get to show you something on that in a little bit. Um, so starting from the broadest possible <coughs> background, from the origin of our modern securities law system, Section 5 of the Securities Act of 1933 basically said that if you're issuing securities, you have to comply with these highly burdensome registration requirements unless you're entitled to an exemption. Uh, one of the most significant exemptions is 4A2, what some of you may previously have known as 4.2 of the Securities Act, which generally exempts transactions by an issuer that don't involve any public offering. Um, that's kind of a vague standard, so there's this great safe harbor, uh, Rule 506B, which is what many people try to comply with, which generally permits an issuer to sell securities to an unlimited number of accredited investors and up to 35 non-accredited investors. Um, there are some key things about that. It's a little bit harder to issue to non-accredited investors. You have to reasonably believe that they have enough sophistication, either alone or with their advisor, to actually know what they're getting into. And you have to provide them with some fairly substantial information about the offering. For accredited investors, it's much easier. Uh, you just have to reasonably believe that they are accredited. There's no specific verification requirement. Typically, and many of you have seen this or filled one of these things out, people are just asked to fill out a brief questionnaire to assert that they are accredited. Um, so the big thing about 506B is that the offering cannot include any form of general solicitation or general advertising. People typically mush that together and just call it general solicitation. There is no single all-encompassing definition of this, but it includes the kind of stuff that you might expect, advertisements in the press, TV and radio, seminars to which the public has been invited, uh, other uses of publicly available media like unrestricted websites, and variations on these things like interviews with the press that effectively get your message out through the interview process or mass email marketing campaigns and the like. Um, given the lack of a bright line standard, attorneys who advise issuers in this area tend to be pretty cautious and tend to advise against any type of public communication that even indirectly advertises the offering. Um, we've talked about accredited investors. What is an accredited investor? Um, as a general matter, for an individual, it means you make at least $200,000 a year, or together with your spouse, you make at least $300,000 a year. Or you and your spouse collectively have a million dollars in net worth. 
Uh, this rule was changed just a couple of years ago. You used to be able to take anything into account. Now you have to exclude the net value of your primary residence. Um, or you have to be a um, relatively high-level insider with respect to the issuer, a director, executive officer, general partner, that kind of thing. Entities also can be accredited investors. There are lots of ways entities can become accredited investors. Among the most common um, is to have at least $5 million in total assets or simply to be owned entirely by people that are accredited investors. Um, many commentators have urged that these standards be increased to make it harder to be an accredited investor, and it's not hard to see why some people might feel that way. Um, the income standards, the $200,000, $300,000 figures, haven't been changed since 1982. Obviously, there's been a lot of wage inflation since then, and, in, and this is my favorite statistic for the presentation. In 2011, the SEC looked at 2007 data and concluded that there were approximately 8.3 million accredited households in the United States. So when we talk about the ability under new rule 506C to be able to generally solicit the public in order to get access to the accredited investors, we're talking about a potentially huge market, you know, some eight plus million accredited households in the United States. So what exactly does rule 506C say? Well, the big thing is it says there's no ban on general solicitation. Issuers generally may engage in any form of communication with the public, and yeah, that means you can put a coupon in the Sunday circular. Um, but of course, there are some requirements. The first thing, as I've noted, is that all the investors to whom you actually issue securities in the offering, and when I talk about securities, I mean if you're a company, that's common or preferred stock or debt securities. If you're a fund, like a venture capital fund, that means a limited partnership or limited liability company interests. Um, there's no special rule that allows you to admit up to 35 non-accredited investors or anything like that. Everybody's supposed to be accredited, uh, but we'll talk about some possible ways around that. Um, next big thing, you must take reasonable steps to verify that all the investors are accredited. What constitutes reasonable steps? Well, it's a facts and circumstances test, but it's an objective test. It's not just your good faith belief or anything like that. It's an objective test as to what's reasonable, taking into account all the facts and circumstances like the nature of the investor, the information you already know about the investor, the nature of your offering. Um, simple self-verification, having somebody check a box or fill out a questionnaire is generally not sufficient. Although there is one special carve out, if you've already taken money from someone into the same issuer, then having them confirm their, invest their credit status through self-verification um, may be okay. Rule 506C provides a non-mandatory, non-exclusive list of verification techniques that are deemed reasonable, and Anne-Marie will discuss those in greater detail. Um, and some third parties have already come forward uh, to provide verification services so that the issuer doesn't have to do that, and again, Anne-Marie will talk about those. So. We'll wait for her presentation for all those details. Um, but one thing I do want to note is that this isn't some terrible strict liability standard. If you reasonably believe that an, that an investor is accredited and you have taken reasonable steps to verify their status, then if it turned out they just hoodwinked you, you're okay. Although it might be difficult to prove that they really did hoodwink you, but nevertheless, you're not technically liable if someone just successfully lies to you. Okay, so there's 506B and 506C. The first thing to note is that 506C did not replace 506B. It's an alternative, it's a new alternative. You can always still conduct a 506B offering, avoid general solicitation, and get the benefits of uh, what it has to offer. And we'll talk about the relative pros and cons. Um, the SEC revised Form D, which is the form you have to file in connection with a 506 um, private offering, um, and you have to check a box to indicate which of 506B or 506C you're relying on. You can't rely on both at the same time. Um, it does appear possible that you can switch, technically, um, by filing an amended Form D, but as a practical matter, it can be really impossible. You know, if you have been conducting a general solicitation under 506C and you wake up one day and say, oops, I want to issue to some non-accredited investors, it's going to be really hard to switch into a 506B offering because you've been conducting a general solicitation, right? You may have to go through some 
lengthy quiet period before you can do that. Um, switching from 506B to 506E could be hard because maybe you haven't been following the investor verification requirements. Um, I will note that there was a transition rule which says that if you've been doing a 506B offering under the current rules before September 23rd and then after September 23rd you switch to doing 506C, the investors that you issued securities to without having followed the investor verification requirements, not a problem. Okay, so you, you get this ability to transition starting September 23rd from 506B to 506C uh, without much difficulty. Um, so, lots of people are going to be really excited about doing a 506C offering that involves general solicitation. Before we get to those goodies, let's talk about why you might prefer to stay with 506B. Uh, well, first, as I've already alluded to, you have the ability to issue to um, some non-accredited investors. Let me note here that it may not be as bad as you think under 506C. Um, two things. First, if you're raising a fund and you've got some people on your team, junior team members, who are not accredited and you want to let them participate into, in the economics of the fund, it may be possible to structure some degree of economic participation by giving them an interest in the general partner of the fund. And as long as that's structured so that the issuance of interest in the general partner is not integrated with the issuance of interest in the fund, um, that should be okay. And there are some techniques for doing that that we feel relatively comfortable with. Um, the other thing to note is that if you want to issue outside the United States to non-US persons, there's a completely different regulatory system called Reg S, which allows you to conduct an offshore offering to non-US persons, and you can sell securities to anybody under that system. They don't have to be accredited. Um, and the SEC has made it clear that doing a 506C offering in the United States will not be messed up by doing a simultaneous Reg S offering outside the United States. Why else might you prefer 506B? Well, you might want to avoid the investor verification requirements. Personally, I don't think those requirements are that burdensome, but we have seen lots of comments by people out there who've said that these verification rules are inappropriately burdensome and intrusive and violation of privacy. And if you run into one or more investors like that, um, you may, in order to get their money, just uh, need to go 506B. Uh, another thing is avoiding, avoiding um, conflict with uh, non-US laws. We've had the ban on general solicitation of private offerings for generations. So have many other countries. Those countries didn't go out and immediately change their laws upon hearing that the SEC had adopted 506C. So if you're targeting investors in other countries and you're doing a general solicitation here in the United States by, for example, posting your offering materials on the web, you know, what will be the impact on the private offering rules in other countries where you might be targeting investors? Well, we haven't really heard much from uh, the securities regulators in those other countries yet, but we will. And I think we're going to find out that in some countries, they don't look kindly upon a general solicitation of their people um, just because the server holding the website happens to be located in the United States. Now, of course, this is only interesting countries were actually targeting investors. I don't think you're going to get into trouble if you post stuff on the web here in the US and you never target um, investors in another country. Um, another reason uh, to prefer 506B is just to stay out of the crosshairs. Whose crosshairs? Well, for one thing, the SEC and state regulators, right? We know that they're concerned that 506C will lead to an increase in frauds, so we expect them to be looking more carefully um, at these offerings. Um, and then there's the plaintiff's bar that I mentioned before. If I advance one slide, I think we've got it. Oh, yes. So um, Bryn, who fashionably late is here, she's back in the back of the room right now, uh, was kind enough to send me this excerpt from a genuine plaintiff's counsel website. Um, and you've got to love these, this thing. It, it really looks like something from a late night television ad. If you believe you've been harmed, contact one of our lawyers for a free consultation. Well, this is the first one we've seen. It undoubtedly will not be the last. Um, there are going to be people out there who think that if you do a general solicitation under 506C that you are a terrific target for a lawsuit. Um, among other things, we're going to caution people to be really careful about how they conduct their uh, general solicitations under 506C for this very reason. Um, coming back, um, uh, then there's uh, people at the states. Um, 506C as a federal rule under 506 
generally preempts state securities laws, often known as blue sky laws, uh, including their prohibitions on general solicitation. Nevertheless, the federal preemption is not this perfect smothering blanket, and there are lots of ways that state regulators um, can seek to make an offering to people in their jurisdictions more difficult. Um, and we expect to see some of those things coming to light uh, in the coming months. In particular, you want to watch out for things like advanced notice requirements, special fees, uh, and the like. OK. Um, also, uh, and Bryn will be discussing this, um, if you are running a fund, and that fund utilizes hedging techniques, uh, or certain other types of uh, derivative uh, instruments, um, you may be operating under an exemption from regulation by the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC. The CFTC has in its exemptions from regulation um, an assumption that you're not engaged in a general solicitation. They have not yet weighed in on whether they're going to change their rules um, to match 506C. So right now, if you're one of those funds, um, that could be a problem. Bryn will describe that in greater detail in a bit. Um, Another thing to be concerned about is gun jumping. Um, if, and this applies in particular for a company that might be contemplating an IPO, right, the IPO rules have their own very specific requirements about how you communicate with the public, what types of documents are presented, what type of information is presented, what types of filings are made. If you're doing a 506C offering in close proximity to an, an attempt to do an IPO, you may be deemed to have those two offerings integrated, and you might be deemed in violation of the IPO rules. So a 506C offering by a company can mandate a postponement or a deferral of an IPO. So obviously, if you're a company, you care about this. If you're a venture capitalist sitting on the board, you care about this. This is something that people need to pay attention to. Um, and then just sort of my cleanup thing is um, just avoiding other potential legal conflicts. I keep saying it. The ban on general solicitation has been in our law for generations. It is, its existence has been assumed by innumerable other laws and rules and regulations, and there's nobody who's had the time yet to scour the country looking for other laws, rules, and regulations where there might be some conflict with a general solicitation conducted under 506C. Uh, it's going to be a long time before we figure this out. Um, and so, you know. If you do a 506C offering, you're taking some level of risk that you know, you'll get some surprise a couple of months later. Um, one thing that is nice to note, though, is the SEC has made it clear that if you're relying on an exemption from regulation as an investment company, this applies basically to funds under 3C1 or 3C7 of the Investment Company Act, doing a 506C offering will not mess that up. On to the goodies. OK, so 506C, lots of potential advantages. The one everybody focuses on immediately is that it offers enormously enhanced access to a really big pool of potential investors. Even though you can only sell to accredited, you can get your story out to the entire public, right? which means basically you can now efficiently um, get access to you know, potentially all of those 8 plus million uh, US households. Um, it's expected that there are going to be people who make a business out of making this easier for you. Um, you know, people who operate web portals and otherwise act as intermediaries will make a business of trying to bring issuers and investors together. Um, and this process has already started in uh, a small way uh, with some uh, web-based outfits like Funders Club and AngelList. Um, another really big advantage of 506C is that it gives the issuer greater leverage vis-a-vis the, vis -vis the capital sources. An issuer who has multiple choices about where to get capital from doesn't necessarily have to take the terms that are offered by any particular uh, investor. Now, for fund managers, this can be a double-edged sword. If you're trying to raise money, this may give you more leverage vis-a-vis -vis the limited partners that you're trying to get money from. On the other hand, when you turn around and try and invest that money, you now have to deal with entrepreneurs and company managers who are themselves empowered by the ability to seek capital from other sources under 506C. Even if you think you got all the money you need from investors that you can easily touch without doing any kind of general solicitation, you might still like 506C because it can offer you greater control over your public persona. Um, you can under 506C, talk to the press whenever you want. Um, 
you can issue press releases to announce any type of activities inside your organization. You don't have to worry about these things messing up um, any type of fundraising you may be doing. Uh, you can add greater detail to your website or other marketing materials to more effectively convey um, your business, your operations, your mission. Um, you can even be more explicit in your marketing materials about your financial status. Right? A lot of people, you know, especially young companies, have to establish that they're stable. They're going to be around for the long haul. How nice if you can say, listen, you can count us on us being around for the long haul. We've already closed on 80% of our $100 million fundraising goal. You know, under 506B, that's not the kind of statement lawyers generally encourage their clients to make in any kind of public forum. 506C offer, also offers some protection against footfalls. Uh, you know, as lawyers, I think everyone on this panel has had the you know, terrifying experience of coming in and finding out that a client has accidentally violated the ban on general solicitation in connection with a 506B offering. You know, there's the slip of the lip, there's the junior person in the organization who never learned or understood the rules, and there's even, frankly, getting caught um, by reporters who are not always in terribly forthright about the law and will call you up and say, hey, listen, you can talk to me. It's okay as long as you do it on background or off the record. And you know, that's not necessarily true. Um, so this can eliminate the risks associated with those types of things. Um, another reason to maybe prefer 506C is that 506C changes the overall landscape from the perspective of the regulators for years when 506B was the main game in town, regulators didn't focus a ton of enforcement efforts against minor breaches of the general solicitation rules, right? Because most of those breaches were conducted by good guys who just accidentally messed up. Now that there's 506C and there is a clear path to communicating with the public, if you choose to go 506B, it kind of looks like you're trying to have your cake and eat it too if you slip up and communicate with the public. You know, basically, from the perspective of the regulators, we gave you a clear path, you ignored it, and you talked to the public anyway. You know, you could actually be facing stricter scrutiny um, in a 506B offering for the kinds of footfalls that sometimes occur. Um, all right. Up to this point, I've talked about basic rules for what you are allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. One very big thing um, is how you do it, okay? So at the same time that the SEC adopted Rule 506C, it proposed new rules that would impose substantial new anti-fraud burdens and uh, compliance obligations on issuers of private offerings. Um, we're going to have a, a whole separate presentation on that, so I'm not going to go into those details. It's worth noting that these rules are just proposed. The public comment period is open now. It will stay open until September 23rd. If you don't like these rules, if you take a look at them, you don't like them, please send a comment in to the SEC. But what that means is that the anti-fraud rule landscape has not been changed. So all the existing anti-fraud rules that you know, everyone has had to comply with for years are still in play. And now I'm just going to very quickly flip over a couple of slides. I've included these slides for you to look at at your leisure. But these anti-fraud rules that apply to offerings under 506B or 506C you know, are pretty broad things. And they're familiar, they should be familiar to many of you. There's Rule 10B-5 under the Securities Exchange Act. There's Rule 206, I'm sorry, there's Section 206 under the Investment Advisors Act. There's Rule 20648 under the Investment Advisors Act. And you know, I'm not going to go through all the words of these things, but basically what they say is, you can't mislead or deceive your investors. You can't defraud your investors. Um, and they are very broadly worded. And indeed, except for certain very specialized issuers, um, such as um, funds that are managed by people who are registered under the, uh, as investment advisors under the uh, Investment Advisors Act, existing law hasn't been interpreted to impose lots of specific, precise, detailed procedure-driven requirements upon issuers. Courts and administrative guidance have focused on the substance of fraud or deception. And this is a key reason why offerings, uh, offering materials for private offerings have been so much shorter and easier to read and less burdensome to prepare than, for example, IPO materials. Um, but because these rules are ambiguous, they're open to a lot of interpretation. 
what exactly does deceptive mean in any given context? Well, I'm sure you can all see that it's possible for two different people to look at the same piece of written material and reach different conclusions uh, about whether that material is deceptive or not. Um, why is that ambiguity so important? Well, because even though the existing law hasn't changed, the environment in which that law will be applied and interpreted has changed significantly. As I keep harping on, um, the SEC and state regulators are concerned that the ability to present what's nominally a private offering to the entire public um, uh, may increase the volume and severity of fraud upon investors. Um, that worry alone may trigger enhanced scrutiny or enforcement action. If it turns out that there's an actual increase in fraud, and it, especially if it gets publicized in the press or otherwise, um, you can expect a significant response from the SEC and uh, state regulators. And here's a crucial point to understand. If the regulators become aware of some new practice or some previously existing practice that didn't get any prominence that they perceive to be deceptive or otherwise problematic, they can attack that by changing their interpretation or expanding their interpretation of prior existing law to assert that that behavior is illegal. Okay? Which means that some things that people were comfortable doing in terms of how you conduct marketing activities under 506B, right? some of those things that maybe were a little bit close to the line but everybody was comfortable because after all we were all in just some sophisticated players club, they may not look so good now in an environment where offerings are made to the general public. And so you know, what we're trying to say here is we all need to reassess our marketing practices given the advent of 506C and probably some degree of additional caution and care is warranted just because of the existence of 506C. Um, it's worth noting, by the way, that even if you haven't done anything wrong, just having a brush with regulators can be really problematic for you. If they open some, in the, uh, oops, what happened here? We just lost our monitor. Uh-oh. Tech support, please. <laughs> Go for I'm your sorry. Phone. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Yeah, I'll do that. Wow. I apologize, folks. Uh, Anthony, would you do a little song and dance while people wait? <laughs> I will if you can't keep it up. I'll give All you right. a minute to recover. So, um, I don't know. Can I people on the? I believe our web audience can. Still oh, okay, see if it. our web audience can, can still see it. So what we're going to do is I'm just I'm just going to keep talking. Um, so. Any kind of investigation by the SEC or state regulators uh, could be problematic. Um, often it has to be disclosed to investors that you're trying to raise money from. And a lot of these investors you know, will kind of run the other way when they find out you're under government investigation. It can be costly or time consuming uh, and distracting to respond to inquiries and document requests and the like uh, from regulators. And once these folks get suspicious, um, you know, even the most perfectly innocent and reasonable behavior can trigger deep scrutiny. So, you know, you don't really want to be involved um, with some sort of government investigation if you can avoid it. And of course, the best way to avoid it is to be as squeaky clean as you possibly can in your marketing behavior. Uh, for those who are trying to get this thing set up, we are now on slide 28. Um, okay, so. We are advising uh, our clients to exercise greater caution going forward. Oops. All right, so let's see how we can. We're trying to, oops. There we go. Thank you. There you go. Okay, so. Um, all right, so let's use some more care in preparing marketing materials. You know, don't do silly stuff, please. Identify the difference if you're talking about financial performance between gross and net returns. You know, tell people what valuation you, method you used. Um, include some warnings and disclaimers. You know, tell people the standard stuff, that past performance doesn't predict future performance, that there is a substantial risk of loss associated with this investment. And crucially, point people to the complete set of disclosure materials in the definitive marketing document like a PPM. And what I mean by that is if you've got any kind of other uh, marketing materials like a pitch deck or an email or something like that, include this stuff. Don't leave documents out there, no matter how short, they could on a standalone basis appear misleading. 
More generally, when you're preparing your marketing materials, when you're done, read them over. Ask yourself, could somebody reasonably think that this is misleading? If the answer is yes, fix it. And please, watch out for social media. One of the things that we're really anticipating um, will be grist for the mill is the environment changes. People start to think you can talk to the public generally about offerings, and you start seeing stuff like Facebook posts and tweets, you know, where people speak in that very colloquial style that is you know, standard on Facebook and, and, and Twitter. And boom, you've got a standalone communication that sure m looks misleading, deceptive, fraudulent. So you know, your organizations are going to have to rein in all the people who are younger than me um, and get them to uh, exercise some discipline about social media postings. Um, one clarification, um, we've been talking about 506C. 506E is not crowdfunding. A lot of people get confused about this. The Jobs Act, the same act that brought us 506C, also provides for a new fundraising approach called crowdfunding. In general, crowdfunding should allow online capital raising from an unlimited number of investors, including non-accredited, through social media and other channels. But, and here's the big thing, it doesn't exist yet. <laughs> it's waiting on rules from the SEC. Maybe we'll see them later this year. Maybe we'll see them next year. But we do know a few things. Uh, first, crowdfunding fundraisings will be small. A maximum of a million dollars per issuer in any 12-month period. Investors themselves will be subject to caps on how much they can invest. Um, and the advertisements will have to go through some sort of intermediary. They can't direct people to contact the issuer directly. Um, uh, in general, we have to go through a registered broker-dealer or a registered funding portal. Uh, this slide uh, talks about you know, what a funding portal has to do, and as you can see, it's a lot like being a registered broker-dealer, including being subject to SEC examination, which means people who are running these portals are not going to be able to provide their services for free because they're going to have substantial compliance costs. Um, and then there are document filing requirements with the SEC. If you're raising more than $500,000, you've got to have audited financials. Um, so crowdfunding, different completely different set of rules and doesn't yet exist, so we're just sitting on our hands waiting for the SEC to tell us uh, the detailed rules that will be necessary to make this work. In conclusion, 506C is going to significantly change the fundraising landscape. Uh, lots of people are going to choose to do general solicitations. Web-based <coughs> and other intermediaries will join the fray and seek to help match issuers and investors. Even issuers that don't try to raise money using 506C will nevertheless um, be able to gain control over their public persona. Um, and we expect that there's going to be some meaningful change in leverage between issuers and their investors. Um, yet, we've got some challenges. Um, some investors may not like the verification procedures. Uh, it may take months, many months, before we actually understand all the conflicts of law. Some of those conflicts of law may never be addressed. And sometimes doing a 506C offering may force you to defer some other transaction that you want to do, like maybe an IPO. Um, 506C simply won't be available to some issuers, such as people who really need to issue um, to some non-accredited U.S. investors. And finally, uh, regulators and plaintiff's counsel will be watching closely. So again, can't say it enough times, it's time to up your game on the preparation of your marketing materials. And just to show you that we are not ignoring our own advice, here is our own disclaimer. Um, these materials are provided for general information only. If you want advice you can rely on, you have to hire us. <laughs> okay, next up. Tanner Brad. Great. Thank you. Pleasure to present. Uh, well, thank you, Jonathan, and good morning to all of you both here in the room and watching online. Um, very quickly, for those of you that I haven't met before, my name's Brad Weber. I'm a partner here in our Silicon Valley office and a member of our technology company's practice and our capital markets practice. So what I'm going to talk about are the new rules, their final rules that have been adopted that relate to the disqualification of offerings involving bad actors. The genesis of these new rules uh, is that Section 506 uh, excuse me, Section 926 of the Dodd-Frank Act, which President Obama signed into law in July of 2010, 
expressly required the SEC to adopt new rules that would prohibit the use of the Rule 506 Safe Harbor for securities offerings in which certain bad actors were involved. And so these new final SEC rules, which were adopted on the exact same day at the exact same open meeting that the general solicitation rules were adopted, uh, they implement that directive under the Dodd-Frank Act. And so the basic elements of the new rule, which is embodied in a new subsection D of Rule 506, are the following. So an issuer will not be able to rely on the Rule 506 safe harbor for an offering if the issuer, any predecessor of the issuer, any affiliated issuer, or certain covered persons related to the issuer or involved in the offering are considered bad actors as described in the rule unless a limitation or exception applies, and we'll talk about what some of those are in a minute, or unless a waiver of disqualification is obtained from the SEC, and we'll talk about that later, uh, or if a court or regulatory authority that ruled on the bad act advises in writing that the disqualification should not apply, meaning their original decision uh, in their judgment shouldn't disqualify you from um, not using Rule 506. And so let's stop and, and before we leave this slide, let's look at a few important points at the outset, all of which you can see on this slide if, if you look closely. So first, the bad actor rule will only disqualify an issuer from using Rule 506. This is, after all, a subsection of Rule 506. And so that means it will not disqualify you from using other exemptions, such as Section 4.2, which Jonathan referred to, or the other sections of Regulation D, such as Rule 504 or Rule 505. So, for example, Rule 505 has its own separate and somewhat different bad actor disqualification rules. So, again, what we're talking about is Rule 506. Now, the flip side of that is that these bad actor rules apply to all offerings under Rule 506, whether you're doing it the new way Jonathan just described, which is a 506C offering involving general solicitation, or if you're doing it the old way, what we call the old way, which is 506B, where you're not using general solicitation. So these rules apply to any 506 offering in general, so that's an important point. And the second point is that the issuer can be negatively impacted. If, if you run a company, you can be negatively impacted by the actions of other people. Um, and I'll describe who those other people are in a minute, but it's important to understand that you can suffer a penalty. You, the issuer, can lose the ability to rely on the exemption, um, either because you as a company committed bad acts, but also if some of the people associated with your transaction or who are members of your team have themselves committed bad acts. So it's not just the company, it's, it's a broader set of folks. So before we get into what these bad acts are that are covered by the rule, um, and we lost our slides again, um, before we get into what the bad acts are um, and what the rule calls bad acts, uh, disqualifying events, so if I use the term disqualifying events, um, that that's the same thing as, as a bad act. Let's, let's discuss the universe of parties that we have to worry about. And so first, as I said, there's the issuer itself. There's the company that's actually offering securities in a proposed offering and wants to rely on the safe harbor under Rule 506. That's easy. Then there are predecessors of the issuer um, so to the extent that the issuer is a successor entity to a previous business, 
will need to worry about the actions of the predecessor. <laughs> now, third are affiliated issuers of the issuer. Now, this is going to be a potential hot button issue for some of the people in this room and also for many of the people watching online uh, who work with investment funds. And hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss this a little bit further in the, in the Q&A session after we're done with our prepared remarks. But for now, let me just say, for those of you who are not familiar, the SEC defines an affiliate to be someone that either directly or indirectly through one or more intermediaries is in control of an issuer, is controlled by the subject issuer, or is under common control with the issuer by a third party. So the classic example of affiliated issuers is a parent corporation and its subsidiary entity uh, or sister companies under the same parent entity. Um, and you can understand why the SEC wanted to capture affiliated entities in these bad actor rules because they didn't want people to be easily able to get around the new restrictions by simply offering securities out of a subsidiary uh, or out of a parent company um, or sister entity. Um, but this does raise a lot of very challenging questions in the context of venture capital firms and their investments in portfolio companies where perhaps they have a measure of control over those portfolio companies. So this is a this is one of the questions we're going to need to continue to talk about and think about and hopefully we'll have a chance to do that after, um, after the uh, opening remarks. Um, now the fourth category of folks that we need to worry about um, are covered persons under the new rule. So covered persons uh, are in addition to all those folks I just described but now really focused on individuals and others associated with the, with the offering. So the first set of covered persons are all directors and executive officers of the issuer. So if you're an issuer, you're a company issuing securities, that means all of your board members and that means all of your executive officers, even if they have nothing to do with the offering in question itself. The second group are any other officers of the issuer who are participating in the offering. And by participating in the offering, the SEC said that's got to be more than just a transitory or temporary association with the transaction. It means you have to be actually involved in the due diligence activities. You have to be involved in the preparation of disclosure documents or communicating with prospective investors. Um, the next set are general partners or managing members of the issuer. So if the issuer itself is a partnership or a limited liability company, those, those entities would be covered. Fourth is beneficial owners of more than 20% of the total outstanding voting equity securities of the issuer. Um, calculated on the basis of voting power, which is actually a big distinction. So if, if an entity owns more than 20%, beneficially owns under the definitions, under the SEC rules, more than 20% of a company's out, total outstanding voting equity securities, they will be a covered person. They'll be somebody we have to worry about. And then fifth are promoters under the uh, that are connected to the issuer in any capacity at the time of the sale. Now continuing, there are a few more categories of people we need to worry about. Any investment manager of an issuer that's a pooled investment fund. Any person that has been or will be paid directly or indirectly any compensation for soliciting purchasers in connection with the offering. Uh, any general partner or managing member of any such investment manager or solicitation firm. And then some key people at the investment managers or solicitation firms that are involved in the offering. So just to reiterate, 
a point I made earlier. Let's look, if you look at the slide that's up, um, you know, the covered persons on this slide in particular and some on the previous slide, um, you know, these are people that um, we're going to have to worry about if we're advising companies or if you're a company yourself or an issuer or an investment fund. You know, these are people who are not within your employ. These are people who you've brought into the deal, um, placement agents, finders, other stuff. Uh, and you can suffer the penalty if they have had any bad acts in their past. So as you can imagine, we think it's probably likely that, you know, folks are going to start to take a closer look in who they involve in their offerings, whether that's placement agents or finders or, or other folks that typically help out in that context. And if they do, I think folks are generally going to have to be more careful about knowing the background of those folks that they involve in the deal. So that's a long list of people, but that's the universe of the people that we need to worry about if we're an issuer issuing securities under Rule 506. And it's a big universe. That, that's the obvious, right? And that's the potential problem, and that's what a lot of folks who've been writing about this since the rules have been proposed or adopted have focused on. So that's the universe of parties. Let's talk about the bad things, the bad acts, or the, quote, disqualifying events of any of those people I just listed that could impact an offering trying to use Rule 506. So the first is criminal convictions in connection with the purchase or sale of a security or a conviction in connection with making a false filing with the SEC uh, or arising out of certain types of financial intermediary activity. And there's a 10-year look-back period or a 5-year look-back period depending on the actor. Second are court injunctions and restraining orders in connection with the purchase or sale of a security making a false filing with the SEC or arising out of conduct of these same financial intermediaries. Here there's a five-year look-back period. Next are final orders from the CFTC, federal banking agencies, National Credit Union Administration, state regulators of securities, which is a big one. There are many state securities regulators that, that get their hands in private offerings, as Jonathan was mentioning. Uh, insurance, banking, savings associations. So final orders from any of those entities that bar the issuer from associating with any of these regulated entities, engaging in any of those specific businesses um, or activities, or any final order from any of those entities that's based on fraud or manipulative or deceptive conduct that are issued within 10 years prior to the proposed day you want to do your 506 offering, any of those will be disqualifying events. Also, certain SEC disciplinary orders relating to brokers, dealers, municipal securities dealers, and some other listed folks that you can see on the slide. Next are SEC cease and desist orders relating to violations of anti-fraud provisions or violating the registration requirements of the federal securities laws. So there we mean Section 5 of the 33 Act. Um, and again, you'll see there are look-back periods. The order must have been entered within five years prior to the date you want to do your deal. Um, and then also some other certain SEC disciplinary orders relating to brokers, dealers, municipal security dealers, and others. Next, suspension or expulsion for membership in a self-regulatory organization uh, or associating with an SRO member. Next, SEC stop orders or orders suspending the Reg A exemption. So Reg A is an alternative exemption from the registration requirements under the 33 Act, but in order to do that, you have to follow very specific rules under Reg A. Um, so if there has been a stop order issued by the SEC under one of those offerings within five years of the post proposed sale that you want to do, that's, that is also a disqualifying event. And lastly, the ever popular and uh, often seen U.S. Postal Service false representation orders 
issued within five years before the proposed sale of securities. And I, I make light of that. Um, but it is a real um, factor for many companies. It <coughs> usually involves using the mails to uh, engage in deceptive or fraud, fraudulent conduct. So it's not a throwaway. We need, to, we need to be mindful of it. So a couple of things just to point out some of the things that we've seen on this list that it might not be self-apparent. But if we're generalizing, the things I just mentioned are securities law type violations, right? So whereas other securities laws sometimes relate to if we're generalizing, calling personal behavior, right? So personal bankruptcies, corporate bankruptcies, criminal convictions and um, involving things more serious than a traffic ticket. That's the, the language of one rule um, that the SEC has promulgated. That's not what we're talking about here, right? And it's interesting, some of the commentators on the proposed rule wanted the SEC to go further and say any criminal conviction based on fraud for any, for any reason should be a disqualifying event in any context. And the SEC said, no, we're not going to go that far. What we're talking about here are uh, securities law type violations. And the second point, um, which was apparent as I was reading, but to reiterate, there are differing look back Period. So some are 10 years, some are five years. Um, and then also, as, you, as we go through that list of disqualifying events that I outlined, some depend on whether an order or an injunction is still in effect at the time you want to do a deal. Others don't um, concern themselves with whether the ban is in effect, but when the ban was originally issued, and even if it is still in effect, but it was issued before the look back period, it will not disqualify your offering. And so on a point by point basis, it's going to vary. So you know, the, the rules are long and complicated. Um, suffice it to say that for each particular category of bad act, you're going to have to look at, at the look back periods and the, and the other specific language to see if that disqualifies you from doing a deal. So now we've covered the universe of parties that we have to worry about. We've, caused, we've talked about the bad acts by any of those parties that we have to worry about. And just to quickly reiterate why this all matters and what's at stake here is that if a bad actor uh, excuse me, if a, if a covered person has had a bad act, a disqualifying event, then you're not going to be able to use Rule 506 and you're going to have to find another exemption for your offering. So 4.2 or 504 or 505 or some other exemption. And as Jonathan alluded, um, you know, 506 is the most common Reg D uh, uh, exempt uh, safe harbor under Reg D. I mean, it, I think the r rule release said somewhere north of 95% of all offerings under Reg D are under 506. It's the exemption you want to use. That's because it has no offering limit on it, as do 505 and 504. And if you use 42, there are state blue sky issues and other state filings. So. You want to be able to use 506. It's the most common. It's the one that almost every deal we do uses. And that's why this matters. So that's why this is such an important topic. So I mentioned that there are, you know, that's the default rule. But there are some limitations and exceptions. So let's talk about those. So the first is a big one. And that is that the issuer will not be, the company that's trying to issue the securities in reliance on Rule 506 will not be disqualified if the bad act, if the disqualifying event by the covered person occurred before the effective date of the new rule, which is September 23rd of this year. It hasn't even happened yet, right? So we start with a clean slate. And any bad act that happened before September 23rd uh, will not prevent an issuer from relying on Rule 506. So your reaction to that might be, all right, well, let's all hurry up and get our bad acts in now. 
let's try and do them in the next month because then we'll be able to uh, use our 506 exemption. But unfortunately, it's not that easy. And so the trade-off that the SEC has decided to make in this context is that while old bad acts will not disqualify you from relying on the Rule 506 exemption, they will require you to disclose those bad acts to investors. And they've codified that disclosure requirement in a new subsection E of Rule 506. And so the SEC has said that when that disclosure is required, and again, it's required if there was a disqualifying event before September 23rd, and but for the rule that says anything before September 23rd doesn't disqualify you, but for that it would have disqualified you. If we have one of those, that needs to be disclosed to investors. And the SEC has said that needs to be provided a reasonable time prior to sale and the disclosure must be given reasonable prominence to ensure that the event is appropriately presented to investors and is a part of the total mix of information available to those investors. So those two things mean you can't drop it on them the night before you take their money, and you can't bury it on page 102 of a 103-page private placement memorandum. You have to be upfront and clear about these bad acts in your disclosure to your investors who are buying in your offering. And the SEC has said that this matters. The failure to do that, the failure to disclose, will result in a loss of the 506 exemption for that offering. So for those of you who are um, securities law gurus, the SEC has said that's not an insignificant deviation under the language of Rule 508, and therefore it will, um, it will cause you to lose the exemption for that offering. Okay. Um, now the second exemption is uh, also a big one, right? So we have the, the historical cutoff point of September 23rd uh, and the disclosure requirements for those before. That's the first exemption. The second one is also a big one and it goes back to um, some of the things that Jonathan was suggesting in his general solicitation. It's a very similar concept. Um, and that is that even if you determine after your offering is completed that a covered person had experienced a, a disqualifying event that would have prevented you from relying on Rule 506, you'll still be allowed to rely on the exemption if you can establish that you did not know and in the exercise of, quote, reasonable care, could not have known that a disqualification disqualification existed at the time of the offering. Now this same reasonable care standard will also apply to the issuer's knowledge of old disqualifying events that are required to be disclosed under that subsection E that I mentioned of new rule 506. So if you did not know that one of your covered persons had a disqualifying event, and you exercised reasonable care in trying to figure out if any of those people had a disqualifying event, um, and you could not have known. Jonathan's example in the, reason, in the accredited, accredited investor status and reasonable verification steps, if they hoodwink you, then you will not retroactively lose the exemption even if you later discover that a bad act had occurred. So as Jonathan mentioned for the accredited investor, this is not a strict liability rule where if at the time you're offering some, at, some covered person had a bad act, you lose the exemption. If you can establish that you, you had a reasonable investigation where you exercise reasonable care and you could not have known in doing what you did that there was a covered person with a disqualifying event, then you will not lose retroactively the exemption. Um, now it's important to be clear that the uh, 
taking uh, steps that constitute reasonable care to discover whether one of your covered persons had a bad act is not absolutely required in order to have the exemption. Um, but it is required in order to take advantage of this exception, right? And so um, you could, in theory, choose not to take reasonable care steps to figure out whether your covered person's had any disqualifying event, but you'll be taking an enormous gamble that you got it right and that all of the people, you know, that long list of people that I mentioned at the beginning, you'll be taking a big gamble that none of those people had any disqualifying event in their, in the relevant period covered by the rule. And as a practical matter for the deals that Anthony and I do, um, it's hard to imagine that any sophisticated investor like a venture capital fund is going to invest money into a company unless they know that that company has conducted reasonable care to figure out whether any of its folks had a disqualifying event. Because again, the consequence of that being true is that you lose the exemption for that offering, which is a big deal. So it's safe to assume that everyone's going to exercise reasonable care um, and they're going to do that in every 506 offering. At least that would be certainly our advice to all of our clients, all of you in this room, all of you watching online. So what does reasonable care mean? Um, and unfortunately, the SEC was not particularly helpful in describing what reasonable care is. Um, Jonathan mentioned that in the context of reasonable steps to verify for the accredited investor status, the SEC gave us a non-exclusive list of things. And it said, if you do one of these things, we think you will have exercised um, a, a reasonable steps to verify. Here, in this context, we don't have such a list. The SEC didn't say, if you did X, Y, and Z, then we, the SEC, believe you will have exercised reasonable care. They said that they didn't think such a list was appropriate. They mentioned that so many different, so many different issuers use Rule 506, varying sizes, various types of entities, that they just didn't think it was appropriate to put out a list. But what they did say was that um, in order to establish that you've exercised reasonable care, you have to have conducted what they called a, quote, factual inquiry into whether any disqualification exists. So what exactly is a, a factual inquiry? Well, the obvious is that you have to take reasonable steps, affirmative steps to investigate. Um, and, a, and as a point for those of you in the room or watching online and those of us that are going to have to live through complying with this rule, it seems pretty obvious that we're also going to want to keep good written records of what we do to verify these people's status. Because remember, in, in many respects, the value of having exercised reasonable care is that after the fact, if you discover someone had a disqualifying event, you're able to hang your hat on the fact that you use reasonable care. So you're going to want to be able to pull out your written documentation that shows that you did that, right? So that's, that's why we think good procedures and well-documented procedures are going to become part of best practices here. Um, and so it's not surprising that, you know, the few examples, very limited examples that the SEC gave in the final rule release refer to good written records. And so the SEC said that a factual inquiry by means of questionnaires and certifications, perhaps accompanied by contractual representations, covenants, and undertakings, might be sufficient in some cir circumstances to establish that you've conducted a, a factual inquiry. And the SEC also indicated some pretty self-apparent, you know, somewhat obvious um, clarifications about a factual inquiry, which is if in conducting your factual inquiry you've got reasonable reason to be suspicious that the person isn't answering the questions, 
then you can't just stop there and you're going to have to continue to follow up um, and take reasonable steps to know that, you, that you're getting to a level of reasonable truth. Um, but the reality is that outside of the few tidbits I just mentioned, um, we really don't know what reasonable care means. We don't know what a factual inquiry means. Um, and we think practice is going to evolve um, starting very soon to standardize a set of steps, particularly in the sort of venture capital and emerging growth company community about um, how to verify that you've taken steps to exercise reasonable care and figure out if any of your covered people have had this disqualifying event. So that's probably going to include questionnaires, um, contractual representations and subscription agreements and related engagement letters with placement agents and finders. Uh, it might require issuers to think about doing public database searches like on the SEC's website or the FINRA's broker check system, which allows you to check the disciplinary history of brokers and placement agents and finders who you might hire to get involved in your, in your offering. And then there's also the, the, uh, the chance that this evolves into there being a third party service provider model where um, a, a third party expert might do um, some sort of a background investigation into people where it might be more difficult to figure out whether they've had any one of these events. I mean, the SEC said for your officers, for your employees, for the people that you've been working with, for uh, you know years in some cases, that the standard of what you're going to need to do is probably a little uh, lower than for some people you don't know. So we imagine that best practices will evolve and there will be a standard set of steps. Um, and then so we talked about those two exceptions, the first being the anything before September 23rd. Um, does not disqualify but requires disclosure. That's one. I just explained the second, which is if you exercise reasonable care and you could not have known um, that somebody had a disqualifying event, then you'll also be able to, you won't lose the exemption. You'll be able to rely on Rule 506. And then the final bucket is um, uh, waivers from the SEC and exemptive orders from a court or regulatory authority if they were the ones that issued the order that got you in trouble, that, that is the hang up, is the disqualifying event. So uh, you can make application to the director of the Division of Corporate Finance of the SEC and say, we had a bad act. Um, it, uh, it was a long time ago. It's within the period that will get us in trouble. But here are the reasons why we think it's unreasonable to bar us from using Rule 506. You can do that. Similarly, you can approach the court or regulatory body that said you had a violation. If that violation is what, what is causing you not to be able to re rely on Rule 506, you can get a written order from that court saying, yeah, they did this, but we think it's unfair to punish them further by having them disqualified from using 506 because it's so important, it's so critical to companies raising money to fund their businesses and grow that we, the core or the regulatory authority, will grant that exemption. So those are two other escape hatches that you have. But as you can imagine, those are ones you're not going to want to hang your hat on. You're not going to want to rely on the SEC being uh, your friend and giving you a break, right? It's, it's really going to be if you have no other option. So the bottom line here is that come September 23rd, when the new rules uh, come into play, virtually every, off your, uh, every issuer conducting a 506 offering of any kind with general solicitation or without general solicitation is going to need to change their practices. So in particular, issuers are going to need to exercise reasonable care in trying to figure out if any of their covered people have had any one of those disqualifying events that I described. And, you know, prior to that, today even, uh, issuers who are bringing on new board members or hiring new executive officers 
um, for engaging with placement agents or finders for offerings that are going to be upcoming in the fall. Perhaps, you know, you're starting to process now, but you're going to be selling securities in October, for example. If you're doing any of those things now, I'd suspect that it's a good idea to do your due diligence and it's, it's going to become part of standard operating procedure for companies to look into when any, whether any of those people have had one of these events. Because if they have, you're either going to be disqualified from relying on Rule 506 or you're going to have some pretty ugly disclosure in your offering documents, right? And neither of those two things are a very good outcome. Um, and again, Rule 506 is the exemption you're going to want to use. So to, to wrap it up, I mean, I think the takeaways are there are still some questions that we need to figure out as an industry. And that means, you know, what exact steps should we standardize in order to establish reasonable care. But in the interim, um, firms like ourselves uh, are going to be working with our clients to help establish best practices. I think reading the rule release, we have some good ideas as to what will constitute those steps. And so we'll be advising clients on the right things to do and how to navigate the, the lingering uncertainty. Um, but it's safe to say that issuers, companies, anybody that's going to use Rule 506 uh, should start thinking now about these rules, about their people, um, and think about the practices and procedures that you're going to want to implement um, if you're going to do a Rule 506 offering because this is, this, the, the world has changed. This is part of the new 506 regime and you're going need to need to comply. And so that's it for the bad actor rules. Thanks to all of you for your attention. And I'm now going to turn it over to Tom, who's going to discuss the new proposed rules. All right. Thank you, Brad. Uh, so I'm Tom Bodwin. I'm a partner in the Private Investment Funds Group uh, based in Boston, so represent primarily venture capital and private equity funds when they're going to raise their capital. And what... Um, we're going to focus on relatively quickly is the proposed changes that the SEC has made to Reg D, to Form D itself, and to Rule 156 of the Securities Act, which applies to uh, sales literature for investment companies. Uh, and the reason we're going to go through it relatively quickly is because uh, some of these are kind of controversial. And as Anne Marie will tell us later, there's a fair amount of opposition to some of these. So who knows what will actually happen in the end. But what I want you to do as we go through these is focus on primarily the fact that many of these changes don't apply just to 156C offerings. They apply to all Reg D offerings. So there's some relatively dramatic changes, particularly I think the disqualification amendments, which are going to apply to everybody uh, and are going to change the way things are done a bit in the industry. So first of all, what's Form D? You know, Form D, just as background, it's a data collection device uh, for both investors and regulators. It's publicly available, so it's filed on EDGAR. And it's really a means by which the regulators are looking for information on what's happening in the private market. You know, they have a lot of information about what happens in the public market. They have a lot less of what happens in the private market. And the Form D is really their means of getting that information. And so you'll see that these proposed changes are really intended to increase uh, both the breadth of the information but also increase where they're getting that information from. One important thing about today's rules is that in order to have a good Reg D offering, although you are supposed to file a Form D, it's not an actual condition to having a good Reg D offering. And as a result, many people don't file the Reg D um, for, or file the Form D for a number of reasons, partly because you know, they want to be in stealth mode maybe. Uh, maybe they don't want uh, people to know how much they're raising. There's a lot of different reasons not to file a Form D. And it's, you know, not, uh, you can still have a good Reg D offering even if you haven't filed it. So what are the current uh, filing requirements? You have to file uh, a Form D within 15 days after the first sale of securities. So oftentimes you see people 
filing within that time period after the sale, or they might file just prior to the sale, reason being that there's less information that you actually have to give on the Form D if you do it just prior to the filing. And a lot of our clients in the private investment funds group will do that so that they don't have to list actually how much they're selling. There's also some uh, uh, amendment uh, requirements. You know, for instance, if you're uh, fundraising beyond a year, you need to file an amendment where you might have to put in a lot of information that you otherwise didn't if you filed just prior to the sale. But basically, it's just that within 15 days of the first sale. So the proposed changes, uh, first of all, deal with the 506C offerings. So with a 506C offering, you actually have to file that Form D prior to the general solicitation, at least 15 days prior to it. So that gets a little bit into the inadvertent foot faults uh, and what happens there, which we'll get to in a little bit. On the advanced Form D, you're providing most of the information, not all of the information that you would otherwise provide on a Form D filed right after the first sale. So things like the size of the issuer offering and sales amount, there you're not uh, having to fill that out. And essentially what they're doing here is they want to know who's out there using general solicitation, particularly the different states. And the states are going to be very focused on who's making these filings. And in fact, in Massachusetts, where I'm from, uh, the securities division there has established a special group just to review these. Uh, and to look at them and to pay attention to people who are doing this. Now, another uh, change which applies to all 506 offerings, which is different, is that you have to do a closing amendment. So you have to actually file within 30 days after you've terminated the offering. So rather than just doing that little pre-filing that we do a couple days before that first sale, now anybody using Reg D has to do another filing, a closing amendment. And the closing amendment will require you to put all of the information that's required by Form D into the system and make it publicly available. So that's a big change. Now there's a proposed cure. You know, they're adding in a lot of different things that have to be done here. So they've said, well, you know, there's a lot of people who are going to have inadvertent or advertent uh, 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 failures to file, so they've added in a cure uh, 30 days within, uh, within 30 days of when you uh, fail to do the filing. You can do the filing and cure the default. Um, on the foot faults, what could happen here is, remember, if you do a general solicitation, so let's say you've done a foot fault, at that point in time, on that day, you're 15 days late of making the Form D filing you were supposed to make. So since you've got 30 days to cure, if you make the uh, advanced Form D filing within 15 days after the foot fault, then essentially you've cured it. <coughs> Excuse me. So the cure uh, is uh, a little bit of a prophylactic you can use. You can only use it once per offering, though. So they don't want people to be gaming the system too much. Now, there's a number of changes to the actual form that have been proposed. And again, I'm not going to go through every single one of these changes, but I'm going to point out a couple of things. Uh, first of all, item three. This applies just to 506C offerings. So prior to 2008, one of the requirements on Form D was you had to list the 10% or more beneficial owners. So that went away. You don't have to do that anymore. Now, for a 506C offering, the SEC wants to know a lot more information about who's behind the offering. So you have to actually list those people who directly or indirectly control the issuer. Item five is also an interesting change. Here, uh, this is about disclosing revenues, disclosing uh, uh, net asset size, if you're a private investment fund uh, or a hedge fund, for example. Uh, there's a box there today where you can just decline to, close, to disclose. So that's pretty easy to deal with. They're going to replace that with not available to the public. So you still don't have to disclose unless you've made it available to the public or it is available to the public. And so information about both operating companies and funds can get out to the public in a number of different ways. 
One way is if you actually use general solicitation materials, you put that information in those general solicitation materials. That's now available to the public, and you have to put it on the Form D. Here, the one I would point out is probably the biggest change to these different items. Some of them are fairly simple. Uh, the biggest one, though, is item 14. So in the past, you had to list the number of non-accredited investors and list the number of total investors uh, on the Form D. Now they want to know how many accredited, how many uh, non-accredited, how many natural persons, how many legal entities, and then how much did you raise within each of those categories. So that applies to all 506 offerings. So that's starting to get a little bit deeper into who's buying what you're selling. And again, it's publicly available. On item 16, <clears throat> this is a pretty big change for operating companies, so it doesn't apply to private funds. Uh, what you currently have to do with use of proceeds is talk about the uh, amount of the proceeds that are going to be paid to related persons. Uh, so, you know, it's, for instance, with a private fund, you would say something about how the management fee, a portion of the proceeds are used to fund the management fee. Management fee gets paid to the general partner or management company. Uh, now, the big change is for a, an operating company, you have to go into some detail uh, percentages being used of those proceeds for these five items, six items. So that's getting a little bit into the guts of what are you actually using these monies for, and again, it's a publicly available document. Th now, they added another six items, uh, or want to add another six items, starting with item 17. Half of these apply to just 506C offerings, but the other half apply to any uh, 506 offering. So item 17, uh, here they want to know, again, more information about your accredited investors. How did you know they were accredited? And again, focusing on the individuals. So if you had natural persons, you know, did you use the income test? Did you use the net worth test? Or was there some other basis, which the other basis is really primarily focused on the entities? Here, item 18, 19, and 20, this is just factual information uh, that's not too interesting. For instance, item 20, you know, if you're a pooled investment fund, a venture capital fund, you've filed with the SEC as an exempt reporting advisor. You've got a number. Put the number on the Form D. Oh, well, we just lost our connection here. Um, so I'm on slide 57, if you're looking in your book. Um, and this is items 21 and 22, and here these just apply to 506C offerings, so they want to know a lot more information about your general solicitation. So item 21, how did you generally solicit? Did you use mass mailings, email, you know, did you use your Twitter account? What did you do? Item 22 is, okay, you're supposed to verify the accredited investor status. How did you verify that status? So did you use uh, publicly available information? Uh, did you use a third party provider, et cetera? Okay. Now, disqualification amendments. This is Rule 507. This is, to me, one of the biggest changes. So before I said you don't have to file a Form D technically to have a good uh, Reg D offering. And that's what the current rule is. The current rule essentially says that uh, if you didn't file a Form D and somebody goes into court like the SEC, gets a court order enjoining you from uh, doing the offering that you're doing uh, under Reg D, then you could be disqualified from doing that offering. That happens very, very seldom. Uh, so really egregious cases. So the SEC has not used this uh, as a means of enforcing or getting people to, to really file that Form D. And as a result, as I said before, some people don't file it, um, you know, if they want to be in stealth mode and the like. So the proposed additional rule, so you're going to still have that rule in place, but there's an additional rule. And I think, I'll go through this, but I think the, the, uh, the gist of this is that there, in almost every circumstance, you're going to file the Form Ds now. Okay, so there won't be a circumstance where you won't. 
So here's what the, the new rule says, or proposed rule. And again, this applies to uh, any offering you're doing under 506. Essentially, it's saying, okay, fine, you didn't do the Form D filing for this offering, but just so you know, you can never do another Reg D offering. Neither you, you know, the issuer, nor any affiliate of the issuer. Affiliate of the issuer, okay, if you know, you're doing Fund 8 today and you don't file the Form D, Fund 9, you can't use Reg D. A little bit more, uh, you know, uh, burdensome uh, is that uh, if you're a private equity fund and you don't do uh, the Form D, your uh, operating companies that you control, your affiliates, uh, they can't use Reg D either. So this can have a collateral effect uh, that can be pretty broad. So the fact that you can't do a future offering, I think just by definition means you're going to file that Form D. Now, the, the rule lets you cure it, you know, and the cure is essentially, let's say you've already done the offering, the offering's complete, you did it two years ago, well, let's advance a couple of years because, you know, you, it only applies post-rule. Um, but let's just say, you know, next year you don't do the Form D and then three years later you decide to raise a fund. You can cure it by filing the termination form on that fund that you did next year, as an example. So you can cure it. So that's the good news. The bad news is even when you cure, you've got a one-year period where you can't do the offering, okay? So I think the bottom line is people are going to be very focused on filing that Form D. And you're not going to have situations anymore where you make that decision of maybe we don't want to do it, maybe we do. Uh, there's very good reasons to do that Form D now. And again, this is pretty controversial because, you know, no one asked the SEC to start regulating uh, people offering out there who weren't using general solicitation and now they've put in a pretty important change that applies to everybody. Now, uh, these next disclosure requirements that they focused on just apply to general solicitation materials. So this is only if you're going to make a general solicitation. So any 506C offering, they want these legends. These actually look quite familiar. You see these in most offerings. Uh, the important thing here is that it has to be on all general solicitation, written general solicitation materials. So, you know, you can't tweet, hey guys, we're rocking on the fundraising, you know, without putting all these things in there. So it's, it'll be a little bit measured as to what people can do in terms of the written materials that are out there. But the bottom line is not, none of this is really all that controversial. For private funds that are out there, they want a whole nother set of disclosures or legends put on the, the general solicitation materials. Um, one is, hey, you're not, you know, so, so everybody knows you don't have the protections of the Investment Company Act. That's in most of our materials already. If you're going to include performance data, then they want a whole bunch more legends. Now, you know, you, you're starting to, and you'll see this with the 156 amendments, is you can see that there's, a, 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 you know, a view within the SEC and elsewhere that, you know, the performance data put out by private funds is inherently uh, ambiguous, uh, maybe unreliable, and so they're very focused on getting that point across to potential investors, particularly in the general solicitation context, but even uh, otherwise, which we'll get to with 156. The last two, well, first of all, the first three, you see those all the time uh, in our offering materials already. The last two uh, you don't typically see, and essentially what they're saying is, hey, just so you know, there's no standard methodology for calculating investment returns among private equity and venture capital funds, and you can't compare funds with each other just looking at their data because they're just simply not comparable. I suspect if this passes, you'll see those two in every fund document, uh, just as a prophylactic measure. Then um, they also added a few things that currently apply to investment companies that are other in other rules under the uh, Securities Act. So if you're going to throw out performance data, not you not only throw that data out, 
um, but you also, you know, in a general solicitation materials, but you also have to give a phone number or a website address where they can gain access to the most current data. So for a, um, uh, a private investment fund, that tends to be quarterly data. Uh, so that quarterly data has to be available um, for any investor uh, that you're trying to solicit with written general solicitation materials. So you have to keep that data updated. Um, and then you have to say if fees and expenses weren't deducted, well, you don't necessarily have to show the performance with fees and expenses deducted. What would the performance be like? But you at least have to say that the obvious, which is it'd be lower. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, <clears throat> so the SEC is very interested in what are people going to do here. And, and as are the state regulators. And so the SEC, at least, is requiring anybody who's going to use 506C for the first two years before they start sending out written general solicitation material, you have to give it to the SEC. Now, the SEC isn't saying that you have to give it, they have to approve before you send it out, but they're saying you at least have to give it. And so this is just a data gathering and maybe a little bit of a witch hunt thing. You know, obviously they're very concerned about fraud, and I think they'll be keeping a very close eye on how are people uh, actually, uh, what, what are they saying in these general solicitation materials, and how much puffing is there? <clears throat> and just our experience with a lot of our clients, particularly on the private fund side, who have been registered for a year and a half now and have been visited by the SEC. The SEC really focuses in on what are you saying in your private placement memos and the kinds of words that are used. And it's really changing uh, a little bit the kinds of words we do use in these private placement memos because they don't like the puffing aspects of them. Okay. Rule 156, this is just for private funds. Uh, so this is actually a pretty important proposed change as well, I think. So <clears throat> currently, there's Rule 156 uh, under the Securities Act applies to investment companies, you know, like a mutual fund as an example. And essentially what it says is, you know, the problem with the sales literature that's put out there is it can be misleading. And Here's a number of ways it can be misleading. And essentially what the SEC is focused on in this rule primarily is performance data, again. And they're, they're very focused, uh, and on other statements, and they're very focused on primarily what's not being said. How can statements be misleading by what you're not saying? And they want to make sure that equal prominence is given to other information that can balance out what you're saying. You know, the most obvious example is you put risk factors. You know, just having, you know, the risk factors we put in a private placement memo, just having those there is not necessarily good enough. Matter of fact, it isn't good enough under this 156. So if this is going to apply to uh, private investment funds, all private investment funds, okay, anybody trying to raise, well, any private investment fund, uh, but if you're out there raising under Reg D, for instance, this is going to apply to you. It's going to mean, I think, a real sea change in how these documents are done, the private placement memos. They're going to have, the language itself is going to have to be much more precise. And so, you know, I started thinking about, well, what are some of the things that you always see in these private placement memos? One statement I love to see is, you know, a statement how you look at these great deals that were done, companies that are well known uh, in the portfolio, and they'll talk about how they led the deal. Okay, well, what does that mean you led the deal? You know, that's a really ambiguous statement. And I think that 156 focuses on those kinds of statements. And it also focuses on the actual performance data you put out, but it really focuses in on we lead deals or we have, the word proprietary, we have proprietary deal flow. You can think of all those things that you put in your private placement memo that kind of puff things a little bit, trying to make you look good. I think there's going to be a diminution in, or there'll be a lot more words around those kinds of statements, and that could be a big change for uh, private investment funds. 
Okay, so in summary, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> these changes apply not only to 156C, but to, you know, all Reg D, some of them, to all Reg D offerings or just um, uh, 506 offerings. Um, Got to file the Form D prior to making the general solicitation. The closing amendment, that's a big one, I think. Everybody's got to do the closing amendment when you, within 30 days of terminating the offering. All these additional fields in the Form D will make some difference. Um, the one-year disqualification uh, for past failure to satisfy Form D, you know, so you can cure it if you didn't file that Form D, but there's a one-year period where you can't do anything, so you really got to think ahead to that next offering. If you d made a decision not to file the Form D, you've really got to think ahead, uh, make sure you cure it one year prior to making uh, the new offering. All these legends and disclosures on general solicitation materials, I don't think that's a big deal because, uh, you know, a lot of these are familiar. It's just that every single general solicitation material, written general solicitation material, has to have it on there. Um, submitting to the SEC, I think you'll, people will be getting phone calls from the SEC questioning the materials that they've uh, put out there. Uh, Rule 156, as I said, I think that could be a big change to the private placement memos and the preciseness of the language used in those memos. It'll start to migrate to a preciseness that you see in S-1 registration statements. These are proposed rules. Uh, people are commenting on them. Some people are commenting quite negatively uh, already. Uh, comments are due by September 23rd, and we'll see what happens after that. Is this working? Okay. Hi. Apologies again for being late. I'm Bryn Peltz. I'm from our New York office, and I woke up this morning thinking, yay, I don't have to worry about getting stuck on the subway or in a taxi in traffic. What I didn't consider was GPS malfunction and not finding a parking space. Last year, regulatory lawyers who um, are also fund lawyers were out here bugging you guys about registering with the SEC um, as a result of Dodd-Frank and the um, taking away exemptions from you that previously existed. At the same time, the CFTC was busy trying to get in on the action and, and changing its rules as well. Hopefully you thought about that at that time, but to the extent that you didn't, the Jobs Act gives us a good opportunity to look at the, the CFTC regs again because, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, the CFTC has not yet taken any action to make its regulations consistent with the SEC and the Jobs Act, so we're kind of stuck for now. So what was the, S the CFTC doing? Well, they expanded the definition of, oh, thanks, a commodity pool commodity pool operator, operator, commodity trading advisor, and what they really did was expand the definition of the word swap. And a swap now is very wide ranging. It can be interest rate swaps, currency swaps, and the problem is that even if you are engaging in one swap, that can make you a commodity pool, a commodity pool operator, a commodity trading advisor. There's no exception, and there are entities out there who have gotten out of their swap arrangements for this very reason. So what does a VC fund have to think about? First of all, at the fund level, are you engaging in any kind of swap transactions? And the answer is probably no, but things that you need to think about are whether, for example, you're um, investing in foreign companies, particularly in emerging markets, and trying to hedge the currency risk to protect your investment, or you know, if you have portfolio companies that have debt obligations and, and you might be hedging in that respect. Um, I don't know how many people, and this is probably a subject for another conference, but uh, VC funds that hedge, for example, their competitors um, of their portfolio companies. But if, if the, at the fund level you're engaging in any type of hedging activity, you have to worry about this. 
Um, more likely, hedging occurs at the portfolio company level, and this is something that you need to think about. It's unlikely that a portfolio company that's an operating company, particularly if it's not in the financial services, is a commodity pool itself. So the portfolio company could, in fact, be engaging in hedging transactions, and the fund and the fund manager still don't have an issue. However, if you have a majority interest in that portfolio company, if you serve on the board, and if somehow you could be deemed to be providing advice to the company in connection with its hedging transactions, that could be a problem for you as well. So what do you do if you are engaging in that one swap transaction and lo and behold, you're a commodity pool operator or a commodity and trading advisor? Well, there are, thank you, there are some exemptions that exist now. One is for entities that you know, have a very, very, very low amount of these types of transactions. Um, your aggregate margin, premium security deposits for your swaps don't exceed 5% of the liquidation value of, of your portfolio, or the net notional value doesn't exceed 100% of the liquidation value of the portfolio. So that means that you would have had to withdraw a, private exemption, a prior exemption that you may have been relying upon and filed a new exemption last year. Um, if that's not the case, and there are particularly a lot of hedge funds that didn't bother doing this at all, you need to think about, you know, if you are in that category, whether or not you, need, you can come under this exemption and apply for it. And it's the type of thing that has to be done initially and then annually. Now, if you are under an exemption like that and you want to um, participate in general solicitation and advertising made available through the JOBS Act, the problem is that the CFTC regs still say that those operating under that particular exemption cannot engage in a public offering and have not reconciled what a public offering is. So if you are operating under that exemption and you engage in general solicitation, you have a big problem. Another exemption is for private funds that only have certain eligible investors in them. They actually are registered with the CFTC, so you would know, hopefully, if you are one. If you're not, you'll, you, again, if you engage in any of these types of transactions, you can think about whether or not you should be applying for this type of exemption. It's thought of as registration light, so even though you are technically registered with the, S the CFTC, you don't have to worry about certain disclosure requirements, reporting requirements. However, if you are operating under that type of exemption and you want to engage in general solicitation and advertising, those CFTC rules also have not changed. You, should, you have to be engaging in a 4A2 offering, which means that you wouldn't be engaging in general solicitation or advertising. So, the bottom line is that if the CFTC doesn't take action soon, any fund and its manager that engages in these types of transactions and is currently operating under an exemption cannot take advantage of any of the new provisions of the JOBS Act. So your choice is, until we hear from the CFTC, and no one really knows, I mean, there, are, there is a school of thought that says the CFTC is just going to um, make the same types of revisions that the SEC um, did and allow for those operating under these exemptions to engage in general solicitation. And there are those that say, you know, the CFTC is still always upset about taking the back seat to the SEC is going to use this as its opportunity to mess things up for everyone. So, your choices right now are to, you know, not engage in general solicitation, even when the JOBS Act rules do become effective next month, to withdraw your exemptions and exclusions, the registration light, and just completely register with the CFTC has its own host of 
reporting and disclosure, and if you think the SEC is bad, the CFTC is, I wouldn't say worse, but different bad. So that's probably something you, you might not want to do, and again, you'd be stuck with not being able to engage in general solicitation at all, or you can just stop hedging. Um, so unfortunately, not very good options out there, but we are hoping that the CFTC will act soon. Great. Well, um, I'm going to try to go a little quickly um, since we're almost the end of the, our scheduled program time, and a lot of what are on my slides are already covered halfway, so I'll skip to uh, kind of the meat of the of, of what we're seeing out in the market right now. So let me go back for one second. As, as we've discussed, obviously, issuers were going to have a choice under the final rules. They're going to choose to generally solicit or not generally solicit. Jonathan outlined sort of the pros and cons of the analysis for issuers. Um, and while the proposed rules around general solicitation, um, the SEC originally just proposed that a company would initially would take reasonable steps to verify accreditation without actually providing any specific examples uh, in a non-exclusive safe harbor that, would, that issuers could follow to make sure that they had satisfied the rules. Um, they got a lot of comments on that proposed approach, which is lawyers like to know what rules to follow. We all like to be able to tell our clients, uh, if you do these things, the SEC is not going to question you, the state regulators aren't going to question you, uh, you're going to be comfortable, and we're going to be comfortable that you've done the right thing. So based on the comments that came back on the proposed rules, <coughs> the SEC actually ended up uh, proposing a list of four non-exclusive methods that an issuer can follow to verify accreditation, which I'll talk about in a second, which I think is a, is a really good outcome. And certainly it's good for lawyers so have to advise their clients on, you know, if they've done the right thing. So what we're hearing about in the marketplace right now, and second market for those of you who are not familiar uh, with us, we're a registered broker-dealer. We transact uh, in the private company space around private placements for all types of issuers and secondary transactions for all types of issuers. So we have been in the business of accrediting investors for many years, since about 2008, so we're pretty familiar with that process. And we've been pretty active in the private placement space for at least the last two years. So as these rules rolled out and we followed them um, you know, very closely uh, and spoke to different members of um, the SEC and members of Congress about where we thought the market would head, we've now sort of identified six, you know, constituent groups and have a view, we think, on where this will all end up. So with respect to private companies, first of all, we think that early stage companies are definitely going to take advantage of general solicitation and general advertising. They're going to go out, they're going to put things on Twitter, they're going to maybe not get a bill, billboard on 101 uh, North or South because those are probably pretty expensive, but they're going to send, we've seen examples when the proposed rules came out, some of the guys in our tech group, uh, their, wife, their wives, one particular guy's wife would buy artisan, artisanal cheese from a farm in New York and all of a sudden she's getting letters in the mail saying the SEC now says that we can ask you for money directly if you're an accredited investor. So maybe the cheese farms in New York are going to mail things out to all of their, you know, cheese buyers. But I think lots of different early stage companies are going to take advantage of these rules uh, in very kind of robust ways. Um, we think that companies that are sort of series A, B stage are probably not going to widely generally solicit or generally advertise because their focus is not on as much money as possible necessarily. It's the right investors. It's getting board members, it's getting institutions, it's getting venture capital backed uh, you know, firms on their board to help them grow to the next level. So while they might talk about the fact that they're raising capital, they may not be looking for the wide uh, you know, opportunity to generally solicit or generally advertise uh, their transaction. Then late stage companies, we think they probably will be likely to widely generally solicit, but they're probably only going to accept institutional investors into the actual round. Um, and you know, the nice thing about what general solicitation allows is, you know, for a lot of your clients probably, and maybe even for your own companies, this means that when your CEO stands up at a demo day and says, hey, we're raising capital, he's now not violating like securities laws in a big way. So he's going to be able to go out there, he's going to be able to confirm that the company or the issuer is raising capital, he's going to be able to discuss 
you know, historical returns in a way that's not fraudulent or misleading. Um, and companies are going to be able to use their website to actually let investors know that they're doing capital funding, uh, capital raising. So we think there's going to be a really wide variety of generally advertising, which I think of as, you know, reaching out to the whole planet and generally soliciting, which I think is maybe web-based or a little bit more tailored um, how companies are going to actually take advantage of the new rules. Private funds, I think the larger, more well-established private funds, our CEO believes that those types of companies are going to really be early adopters of the general solicitation potential, and they're probably going to use it as a branding opportunity for the fund. They may not be, again, looking for everyone in the world, the 8.3 million credit investor homes are not going to be able to get into these hedge funds or other pooled investment vehicles, but they're going to be looking to create a brand to let people know the types of funds that they're raising capital for, um, you know, take out really kind of high profile advertising in Forbes or the Wall Street Journal. They're probably going to try to tailor those activities around creating a brand for the fund. So we'll see if that happens. Um, individual investors, there was a lot of conversation in the proposing rules and the final rules that the SEC put out about individuals' likely um, discomfort around providing highly personal financial data to, you know, issuers in general. Um, so one of the things that I'll talk about in the non-exclusive list of ways that you could verify accreditation is utilizing a regulated third party, so a broker, dealer, a lawyer, a, C a CPA, or a registered investment advisor. So the SEC sort of acknowledged the fact that individuals are not likely to want to just broadly provide W-2s or other types of personal information to issuers, which I think is a, is a, good, uh, a good result. Institutional investors, I think we don't think they're going to be that worried about providing information to prove accreditation. Um, the SEC's focus around potential fraud is definitely in the context of natural persons. You have to verify the accreditation status of entities as well, but there are many ways to do that that are not intrusive to the issuer, uh, sorry, to the investor. If you're a broker, you check bro you would check broker check. If you are the CEO of a public company, I'm sorry, go back to entities. If you are um, um, you know, a quib, you could look at somebody's SEC filings, determine what their status is, or other public entities where you can actually generate information. They're not going to have to provide information to the issuer or third party to verify their accreditation. So we think their, their comfort levels could be much higher about being involved in 506C offerings and, and going through accreditation verification. Um, investment platforms we think are going to be variable. You have some referral type platforms like AngelList, Slated, and, and CircleUp that act sort of as a you know, matching service for investors and for companies. They are not registered broker-dealers as a general matter. Um, they may or may not take advantage of the ability to generally solicit on behalf of issuers who are trying to raise capital for their platform. I think we probably will see uh, those sort of activities or more prominent um, access to investment opportunities um, than is available right now. And for other types of platforms like Lending Club, which is an actually issuing securities itself, Again, we think that they probably will take advantage of a lot of the flexibility around talking about offerings publicly, letting people know when rounds are open, and you know, being more communicative about how they've done historically in the past. And then last but not least, broker-dealers. Um, we think that many broker-dealers are going to take advantage of the general solicitation and general advertising potential in order to sort of amplify the ability for that broker-dealer to raise capital on behalf of its you know, clients. Um, what they will end up meaning, again, I think we're going to see as the market develops. And we think smaller broker-dealers are going to be pretty aggressive about utilizing the flexibility in order to reach out and get capital for their issuer clients. So I, I think it's going to be, in my mind, and, and not I, I should pretend I'm with the SEC, and these are my opinions and not the opinions of the second market, which probably be more actual hyperbolic than mine would be. But um, I, I think that we're going to see vast majority of approaches, and I think that over time, um, and also specifically prior to the SEC potentially adopting the proposed rules around uh, general solicitation that are out there, we're going to see a wide variety of issuers doing a wide variety of activities. Um, and then I think sort of normal patterns of behavior will uh, evolve um, that all the market players and investors become comfortable with. So. But in the context of um, allowing individual investors to participate in 506C offerings following general solicitation, um, you know, again, the SEC actually put forward 
adopted four non-exclusive methods that you can follow. They were very clear in the final rules that this is not a requirement that you follow one of these methods, but these are safe harbors that if you take these steps, you won't be second-guessed as a general matter by the SEC or by the state regulators, um, which is, I think, pretty helpful to your offering. So the first uh, activity that an issuer can do is that they themselves can verify um, if you're familiar with the accredited investor definition for individuals, you can either satisfy a net income test or a net worth test. The net income test is that you made at least $200,000 in the previous two completed fiscal years and you have an expectation of making the same amount of money in this year. And net worth is you have at least a million dollars of net worth uh, excluding your primary residence. So an issuer is going to have to look actually at documents to verify that individual satisfies that threshold. So they're going to have to actually look at W-2s or 1099s or K-1s. Um, to verify net worth, they're going to actually have to get brokerage statements, um, certificate of deposit statements. They're going to get uh, tax assessments on investment property, or they can get third-party independent appraisals on art collections, or I would like to have a very expensive fine wine collection, which I don't have yet, but it would be nice to have one of those. Um, so, you know, all these different esoteric assets that people might have that contribute to their net worth, you'll be able to get appraisals for those to actually um, show your net asset number. On, the net on your net liabilities, uh, the issuer is going to have to get a credit report from the actual potential investor, and then they're going to have to get a written representation from the investor that their total liabilities don't um, make them... Um, incapable of satisfying the requirement of a million dollars in net worth. So if you're, you can also qualify for net income or net worth joint with your spouse. The rules, the final rules also require that whoever's doing the verification has to actually look at your spouse's forms as well and get represent, written, written representations from uh, the spouse, which is quite different from the current version, uh, the current way you credit people, which is you generally get a questionnaire that's completed by the one investor who represents that they and their spouse jointly have the sufficient level of income or net worth, but you're not really getting the spouse to verify that as well. So this is quite a change in how you verify on a joint basis. Um, the other thing that, um, the other part of the, uh, the third part of the um, non-exclusive list is that you can outsource this activity to, as I said earlier, basically a regulated entity, a regulated broker dealer, a lawyer, a CPA, or a registered investment advisor. Um, it doesn't mean that, again, this is a non-exclusive list, but I think that most individuals are going to be more comfortable knowing that they're providing their information to somebody who's regulated by the SEC, FINRA, the legal bar, you know, the uh, CPA, whatever the version of the CPA bar is, and that I think the regulators have proposed this because they're going to have a lot of comfort if they know they can go in and actually examine the process that third parties are, are utilizing to verify accreditation. So at the end of the process, if the third party's done the verification, the third party's just going to provide representations to the issuer that they have verified that these certain people are accredited and potentially these are not. So I think we think that that's where the vast majority of the market's going to head is to third party verification because I don't think issuers are going to want to do the verification themselves. I don't think they want to take that liability on. I don't think they're going to want to have to worry about you know, leakage of people's personal identification or personal financial forms. Um, but again, uh, I think, again, that that's where the market's going to head. And the last uh, prong of the non-exclusive safe harbor is that if you, and I think Jonathan covered this as well, if you have already invested in a company through a 506 offering as an accredited investor and you're still a shareholder in that company, you just have to provide the issuer the certification that you're still an accredited investor. So that's a nice grandfather provision for people who are already shareholders in your company, as long as you don't have a belief that they're actually not an accredited investor anymore. Okay. And then real quickly, what one, as, as a registered broker-dealer, again, who's been in this space for a long time, we have a lot of experience in the second market with actually putting people through accreditation. Um, since about 2008, we have about 100,000 participants who signed up on our platform. 25 to 30,000 have gone through an accreditation process. Um, so what we've done in the past year and a half is we've created a process already to verify accreditation uh, for, for issuers. Um, so we have a, what we call a general solicitation product that would allow issuers to direct potential investors to the second market website 
on our website, they'll complete all of their subscription documents if it's a fund investment or all their purchase and sale agreements if it's, an issue, if it's a straight company investment. Uh, we'll run all potential investors through accreditation. We'll give the company a report that tells them who was verified to be accredited and who wasn't. Then all the transaction documents will be executed by people who are actually able to invest in that transaction. We'll run broker background checks if they want us to do that as a broker dealer. And then we basically do the fund closing mechanics. We put together sort of a four-pronged product to bet to the back end of all these 506 B and C offerings. Um, we're also looking at potentially developing a standalone accreditation verification product if that's what the market wants to see. So lots going on. It's been a we had a bet at Second Market. Um, I bet that the rules would be adopted before Labor Day, and the vast majority of um, our business guys said that they would be after Labor Day, or that I was just crazy. Um, so I hope they're all watching at home. And don't forget, I won our bet. So, um, but I'm sorry to talk so fast. I just wanted to cover a lot. Oh, and just one other quick thing. If uh, people are interested, we have a legal learning center on our website that has a lot of information around general solicitation, some great memos. Goodwin Proctor did a really good, uh, several really good memos uh, on all these topics that are on our legal learning center that we stole with permission. Um, and um, so anyway, that's a kind of a great place to check if you're looking for one place to look at the proposed rules, the final rules, and different commentary in the space. And I'll done, I'll done with my sales pitch. Uh, that, that, that's great. We, we're happy to have Anne-Marie uh, in Second Market willing to join us because it adds a little bit of the, um, the market and the realistic perspective on how people are going to operate um, with a lot of these rules. Um, we've run a little long. We do want to leave some time for Q&A if there are questions out there. I might have a couple for the panel if, if you all don't. Um, but we're respectful of people's time. We told you this would be a couple of hours, and um, hopefully we've um, given you good background on the rules and added um, a sprinkling of practicality into it and, and some predictions, which I thought um, Anne-Marie did a wonderful job of um, that we agree with in terms of how this is probably going to play out. And it certainly will be interesting to watch. So I don't know if there's any questions out. Um, you know. Well, I can take a shot at that. I, it, it's maybe repeat the question if they didn't hear. Oh, okay. Um, so, Neil, I'll try and summarize. Um, the question was obviously there's a very extensive list of disqualifying events under the bad actor rule. Um, the final rule release refers to U.S. disqualifying events, and Neil's question was if. Um, we have portfolio companies or venture capital firms that have operations outside the United States. Would those similar bad acts um, somehow affect the, the 506? What I'm really asking yeah. is, you know, if Goodwin Proctor is representing a limited partner or other similar big law firms suddenly say, well, you need to check this too, even though it's not clearly required. Well, um, I won't speak on behalf of the firm, the typical SEC um, disclaimer that they always give. Um, the rule release was pretty particular, Neil, about um, you know, some of the concerns about foreign judgments and the fact that the due process standards might be different in foreign jurisdictions, as you can imagine. Um, what might constitute a violation in a foreign country might be subject to a different standard and a different legal regime. Um, and so I think the SEC was pretty clear that that wasn't part of what they were trying to capture. Um, I think from our perspective, as best practices, would we insist on something like that? Um, 
I don't think so for some of the same reasons the SEC didn't think so. Um, I think, however, the general background checks into publicly available information can enlighten the reasonable care standard to look into the background of those folks. So, not that it's an automatic disqualification, but that it might suggest if you found evidence of something of that nature that there, where there's smoke, there's fire. Perhaps I should look a little deeper into this entity. Perhaps they have been doing some U.S. activities, and if they ran afoul of laws in, in Germany, maybe they're, maybe they're doing similar activities here in the States. And so I think the answer is it would heighten our sensitivity to those folks. Um, but I don't think, uh, speaking for myself only, I don't think we would take the position that that means they are automatically disqualified from participating. Another question about the bad actor roles. So if you have a Reg D offering that commenced prior to September 23rd, starting on September 23rd, do you now need to go out to all of your placement agents and also everyone in your institution for that offering about making sure they comply with these reps and warranties and covenant and consent? And, and that's your question. Yeah, so the final rule release contains a transition period disclosure such that any sales that you completed prior to September 23rd won't be negatively affected. Um, if the offering is continuing past September 23rd, you are going to have to, you are going to have to, if you make a sale on September 24th, um, you're going to have to make that inquiry. And if it's historical, you'd have disclosure. Um, and if it's disqualifying because it happened that, I mean, you got to think about the timing element. It would have to have happened that day to disqualify you that next day. Um, you're going to have to look into it. So the point is, if you have an ongoing offering, any sales you completed prior to the enactment of the new rules will still be okay. If that offering is continuing past September 23rd, I think you are going to have to ask the folks that are involved in the deal what their status is. Um, so that's, that's the transition rule that the SEC has proposed. And, and I guess I'll just add, if, if, you, if you envision that you're going to have a continuous offering that straddles that period, uh, you know, rather than have to scramble at the last, you know, July, or excuse me, September 24th to get that information, um, might make sense to start that process sooner rather than later so that you know um, you know how you're going to respond to it once it's immediately applicable to you. Well, thanks everyone. I don't think there's any more questions. We'll, we'll wrap it up there and um, obviously feel free to, to reach out to anyone on this panel if you have follow-ups or questions. And uh, have a great rest of the day. Enjoyed uh, speaking with you all this morning. Thanks. Thank you.